So I just, uh, this is part three um, of a series of videos on um, the new uh, shingles vaccine, Shingrix. Um, <clears throat> why am I covering that? Isn't that just a cute little um, rash that occur shingles rash that occurs in uh, older people? Well, <clears throat> actually, uh, shingles is associated with heart attack and stroke. Um, and um, actually, the uh, the other issues, blindness, intractable pain, um, are causes of si significant disability. Uh, probably bigger issues than the heart attack and stroke associated with uh, shingles. So <clears throat> this is a it's a big deal. It's a public health issue, and that's why this is um, being covered on a heart attack and stroke channel. By the way, just a brief introduction, my name is Ford Brewer, F-O-R-D, Brewer, B-R-E-W-E-R, -E -E and as I mentioned, this is the Heart Attack Stroke uh, Disability Prevention Channel. Um, <clears throat> I used to run the prevention program at Johns Hopkins a um, long time ago, still very interested in um, what goes on in the field, still practicing in the field, and um, this channel is about, it's a free uh, uh, access to information. So you can help prevent your own death and disability. <clears throat> now, this is part three of a series on the new Shingrix vaccine. And um, <clears throat> I know there's a lot of people that don't want any new vaccines at all, let alone a new vaccine. And I get that and uh, totally respect it. But I do want you to know the information around it and why it's been approved. Uh, again, two other uh, videos are available on it. The first video I did was basically some of the pain and public health problems associated with shingles, not just a cute little brash you see among old people. The second video was why there was debate. The actual uh, Advisory uh, Committee on Immunization Practices, ACIP of the CDC, and the FDA uh, had significant debate and actually came up with an eight to seven split decision. Uh, both safety and uh, efficacy and cost, all three of those things, both safety and efficacy both came up in the debate as they always do in any new um, vaccine. But here was the decision. They broke their they were they broke their long-standing practice of not recommending one vaccine over another, and here's why: because of the efficacy of the new vaccine compared to the uh, efficacy of the existing one, Zostavax, which I had in my mid fifties. Um, Zostavax was not recommended until age sixty, um, knowing that uh, these uh, the bad parts of shingles occur even in the 50s, I went ahead and took my chances with the recombinant Zostafax vaccine. So you can probably guess what I'll do about shingle, uh, about Shingrix. The other thing that they did in terms of the debate was to say, we haven't had post-market ex safety experience. And that's true. They haven't. All they have is the uh, clinical trials experience uh, at the time that they did this recommendation. Now, this is the clinical trials experience. There are actually two studies, uh, one in people 50 years and older and the other in a, people age 70 years and older. Both of them were covered in the New England Journal. I'm going to cover in this video the one in age 70 years and older, and we'll talk about why in a few minutes. But again, key components of it. The New England Journal of Medicine, um, clearly uh, many people would say the best journal in uh, medical science in the world. Um, and the title is Efficacy of the Herpes Zoster Subunit Vaccine in Adults 70 Years of Age and Older. Now, uh, subunit, we'll talk about what that means in just a minute. Uh, when was it? It was published in September, September 15 of 2016, and I will provide the uh, links uh, or citation as usual. Um, <clears throat> here's the abstract. Uh, basically what they say is there's already uh, been a trial involving adults 50 years and older of the subunit uh, vaccine. What does subunit mean? What are we talking about here? It's a recombinant vaccine. Um, um, the previous one, 
uh, Zastavax was a, um, an attenuated virus vaccine. What that means is uh, they used some processes to make that va the uh, vaccine less likely to infect, or many people would say where it can't in infect. The problem is those vaccines do have significant, uh, some significant risk for people with um, immune dysfunction. Well, why would you take this vaccine, uh, shingles vaccine, in the first place? Because of waning immune de uh, function or decreasing immune function. This is a, a significant issue, especially as we get older, 70s or 80s. And again, it's because people in their 70s and 80s are getting more and more uh, dysfunction of their immune system. So that's why a recombinant uh, vaccine is a much bigger deal. Uh, they only took one piece. It was the glycoprotein E component. They didn't take the vast majority of the virus. So the virus couldn't replicate. It, it couldn't, it, it's not a whole virus. It's not an attenuated live virus like the, again, like the other one was. The, um, they also added an a, what's called ASO1G um, adjuvant. What's an adjuvant? Well, basically, it's something that stimulates the immune system. So you give an antigen and an ad adjuvant. Antigen is the piece of the virus, the glycoprotein E, and the adjuvant is the ASO1B. So um, that's all that's included in here. You don't have other virus particles. Another thing is, you know, with, um, <coughs> with the non-recombinant uh, vaccines, you have to use things like eggs to grow the virus itself. <coughs> you don't have to do that with the recombinant vaccines. Now, <coughs> what was the number? The simple number was 97.2% uh, lower risk of infection than placebo. So it didn't completely wipe it out, but it got practically there. It's a very good efficacy rate for this vaccine. And again, this is the study. There were two studies in the New England Journal, two clinical trials, one was for people 50 and older, the other for people 70 and older. It was done by the same group. And it was a multi-center study. The same mul uh, multiple centers were involved with it uh, to get the larger numbers that they got with the 50 and above. They had, what, a quarter of them 70 and above. So they did a separate study looking at 70 and above. Again, for two reasons. Number one, because the biggest issue is in 70 and 80 year olds, although it can occur in the 50s. Uh, number two, there were far fewer 70 and 80 year olds, so they wanted to do a separate study looking at it. They got 13,900 70 year old participants and above. Their mean age was 75.6, or their average age. Um, <clears throat> now, of the people that got the, uh, and they had 3.7 years of follow-up, in the recipients, 70 years and above, um, oh, let me go back. Yes, in the recipients of the vaccine, 23 people got an infection during that seven, uh, 3.7 years. So 6,950 got the vaccine itself. They followed them for 3.7 years. If you got the vaccine, 23 got shingles. If you didn't get the vaccine, 223 got shingles. So again, <clears throat> significant uh, difference. What's the 95% confidence interval for, for that? Uh, and what is a 95% confidence interval? Let me back up. So basically that's saying, look, if this actually happened at random, uh, if the this, this stuff actually didn't work, what would be the probability of seeing these kind of numbers? Well, um, actually it looks like the probability would be 0 .0, less than 0 0.001, meaning the probability of that occurring is less than one in a thousand. So <clears throat> it's pretty clear this vaccine works. Um, they did a pooled analysis in the 50 and 70 year olds. Uh, the vaccine efficacy was 91.3%. Um, 
<clears throat> and if efficacy against post-traumatic neuralgia was 88%. That's the big deal. As I said, the post-herpetic neural neuralgia is the major disabler. It's also associated with, uh, again, heart attack, stroke, uh, some of the big uh, issues associated with zoster. Okay, <clears throat> now, what about uh, short-term problems? Uh, solicited reports. In other words, that, this means they went and asked, did you have any problems? They didn't just wait for people to say. And, and this was for things happening within the seven-day period after getting the vaccine. The probability was 79% that you have something if you get the vaccine and 30% if you didn't. So, what, 80% versus 30%? About 50% of people are going to say, yeah, I had... GI problems, I had cramping, I had, it felt like I felt feverish, I felt bad. These are things that are short term. They lasted uh, for a couple of days mostly, but again, they're looking for that kind of short term vaccine reaction. Probably associated with the adjuvant. The adjuvant is set there specifically to create an immune reaction. Um, <clears throat> how about serious events, potential immune medi mediated disease uh, deaths? They occurred, but they occurred at the same rate whether you got the vaccine or um, a um, placebo. So also, when you, if you go to the, if you click on the link I give you and you go to the New England site, they, get, they have these great little uh, two minute videos. This one's two minute, nine seconds. And it tells you all about what's, uh, what this study was about, why it was significant. And again, it covers things that I've already covered. Um, Herpes is not just, I mean, uh, uh, zoster, shingles, is not just a um, cute uh, rash that occurs in older people. It's a public health problem. Um, the, there is an existing vaccine. It's uh, Zostavax. It's attenuated virus, and it decreases this problem maybe 30%, 50% for younger people. This decreases the problem over 80%. So very, very significant change. That's what's created some of the debate because they decided to take a much stronger stand than they usually do for recommendations for virus, uh, viral vaccines. Um, <clears throat> those are the key points about the study. I'll just, uh, again, go through and show some pictures that I have for previous uh, videos to help you connect some dots. Yes, this is just... Uh, you and me and others uh, when we were kids and we got chicken pox. Um, these are some of the pictures of uh, shingles that occur uh, in folks. Shingles is classically um, in what we call a dermatome. Why is it a dermatome? And why, does it, why is it associated with that childhood disease? Because unlike other childhood diseases, uh, Varicel zoster, uh, the chickenpox vaccine, doesn't get entirely killed. It just remains dormant in the nerve root next to the spinal ganglion. As we get older and start losing complete function of our immune system, we begin to have episodes where we get where that virus crawls back out through that nerve root, and um, that's how you, why you get what we call a dermatome pattern. Just a diagram showing what's happening. The uh, the child with chicken pox doesn't totally eradicate it because the virus goes back to the spinal cord, nerve root ganglion. As the patient gets older, starts to develop some sort of nerve um, immune system problem, it crawls back out and creates an infection right there in that nerve root uh, area. Again, this is why this is not just a... Uh, just a nuisance. It's a public health issue. Uh, nerve root ganglion are all, also for our cranial nerves, like our trigeminal nerve, our optic nerve. Um, when those are infected and reinfect the eye, uh, the trigeminal area, uh, we can get blindness, heart attack. Uh, a heart attack can, can occur with increased heart attack and stroke risk occurs with any of the uh, the uh, zoster. Uh, recurrences. Um, 
And again, as I mentioned, the major disability associated with post-herpetic neuralgia, in other words, those months and months worth of pain associated with it. Again, speaking of months and a long time of pain, uh, I've done several, I've done a very, several very long videos on this issue. Thank you again for your interest if you're here at this point.